The legacy of Barack Obama, as the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report, Glenn Ford has pointed out, has been the near total collapse of the left. Obama for eight years diligently served the interests of Wall Street and the war industry. His assault on civil liberties with the drawing up of kill lists that included U.S. citizens, misuse of the Espionage Act to prosecute government whistleblowers, passage of Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act to empower the military to act in a time of crisis as a domestic police force, and failure to protect our privacy after the revelations of Edward Snowden has furthered the assaults begun by George W. Bush. Obama oversaw the largest transference of wealth upwards to the 1% in American history. He championed charter schools and did not reform our monstrous system of mass incarceration and failed court system. Obama to push through his disastrous for-profit health care system, the equivalent of the bank bailout bill for the pharmaceutical and insurance industries, crushed the single-payer movement. He not only smashed the left, Ford writes, he humiliated it. RT correspondent Anya Parampel looks at some of the darker decisions of the Obama presidency. President Barack Obama's eight years are up. Running on hope and change, many hoped his presidency would usher in a progressive revolution. Instead, they got disappointment. One of the disillusioned is academic and activist Cornell West, who recently declared the Obama era, quote, may have been our last chance to break from our neoliberal soulcraft. Obama's first action as president was to sign an executive order demanding the closure of the Guantanamo Bay prison camp. Eight years later, there are 196 fewer detainees than when he took office, but the facility still stands. It will soon be under the control of Donald Trump, who has said he will not only keep it open, but will, quote, load it up with some bad dudes. President Obama also chose not to prosecute architects of the Bush administration's torture program. So while Obama signed an executive order banning torture, there's nothing stopping the next Secretary of Defense from bringing the practice back. Prosecuting bankers who caused the financial collapse of 2008 wasn't necessary in Obama's eyes either. Perhaps that's because he riddled his cabinet with pals of Wall Street, the same ones he voted to bail out with taxpayer money as senator. When Occupy Wall Street demonstrations exploded nationally in 2011, Obama described the protests by jobless, desperate Americans demanding Wall Street reforms in a future as similar to those of the Tea Party the right-wing movement, which characterized Obama as the Antichrist. Similarly, when Black Lives Matter erupted over the impunity of police who kill unarmed black men and women, Obama urged, quote, mutual respect and labeled Baltimore protesters who rose up in their city as thugs and criminals. When it comes to foreign policy, he expanded President Bush's secret, unaccountable drone warfare program outside of war zones. The administration claims it has killed up to 116 civilians across three countries. The Bureau for Investigative Journalism tallies that it's more than seven times that. The administration claims it has the right to wage war on half the globe under the authorization of the use of military force and asserts it has the right to kill Americans abroad without due process. Influenced by his hawkish Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, he oversaw the NATO bombing campaign in Libya, which led to the murder of the country's leader, Muammar Gaddafi. Obama himself has said the intervention didn't work, as the country has dissolved into an ISIS death chamber. Obama handed Israel a $38 billion military aid package, the largest in history. That was despite Israel's 51-day war against Gaza, which left 2,000 Palestinians, including 500 children, dead and the tiny strip utterly destroyed in 2014. Yes, we did. Yes, we can. Thank you, Anya. Glenn Ford, the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report, and the host of Black Agenda Radio is one of the most fearless and important social critics in the country. He, along with a handful of great black intellectuals, including Cornel West, Bell Hooks, and James Cone, keep alive the black prophetic tradition, the most important intellectual tradition in American history. His ruthless honesty about the Obama administration has made him many enemies, especially among the black bourgeoisie. But he has proven to be as prescient as he is courageous. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, thanks for having me. So let's look at the eight years of Barack Obama 
our first black president. Um, what, what has that meant for African Americans? Well, it means that uh, a black person has grabbed the brass ring or the golden ring, and we've now had eight years of experience of what that means or does not mean in terms of uh, black America. Uh, it's a lesson that was uh, learned at great cost, although I suppose it's a lesson that had to be learned, I'm, and I'm speaking of uh, for black people, uh, to understand the, uh, well, some of the futilities uh, involved in, in this uh, duopoly electoral system, which actually selected the black man that we uh, then celebrated having assumed that office. Is that been a negative? I mean, I've heard you speak about uh, how it's actually damaged the integrity of the African-American community vis-a-vis -vis empire and other issues. Well, sure it has. Uh, you know, there's, there's, black folks are not geniuses. Uh, there are no genius uh, people. Uh, people are all the same. Uh, but we did have one advantage in, in terms of dealing uh, with this uh, merciless capitalist uh, system and its imperial policy. And that is that our uh, history uh, conditioned us to look with skepticism uh, at power, to not trust whatever power said, uh, to not believe what people in power said, uh, because people in power had always lied about us, and we knew that they would lie about other people, especially people uh, of color. And we knew uh, that people in power in the United States were up to no good uh, with their military and their security forces because of the way they treated us. So we were skeptical uh, about U.S. Uh, military adventures abroad. And all of the polls uh, since they've been tracking black folks as a group uh, have shown that black America is the most uh, opposed to U.S. military adventures abroad and the most left-leaning in terms of uh, domestic bread and butter uh, issues. That's a product of our history. Uh, but with the ascension of Barack Obama, the first black president, uh, that historical skepticism among black folks, skepticism about uh, power and the uses of power and the intentions and motives of people in power uh, was weakened. And so so we saw in 2013, when President Obama was threatening uh, to do a, an airstrike uh, against Syria, uh, a poll uh, taken about two days before he called off that airstrike showed for the first time in history that more black folks, that is a greater proportion of black folks, were in favor of an airstrike against Syria than white people. Now, it, only a minority of people of all races uh, favored an airstrike against Syria uh, in late August of 2013. Uh, but still, uh, more black folks favored than white people. And that had never, never uh, occurred. So we, we, we can see from that uh, and other kinds of evidences uh, that the skepticism uh, that has been uh, a part of our progressiveness uh, has, has been worn away just by virtue of having a black man and his family in the White House. Cornel West calls him a black mascot for Wall Street. Is that how you would sum up his eight years? Well, they're all mascots for Wall Street, and he is black, so yes, commonsensically, he, he is correct. <laughs> well, what, do you think that uh, the, the policies that he has furthered, uh, austerity, uh, cuts, uh, school closings, et cetera, the inability to deal with uh, mass incarceration, uh, violent crime in places like Chicago, and yet, of course, he goes off to Newtown. It, it doesn't match his rhetoric. His rhetoric is one of compassion, concern. What has been the consequence, consequences of that within the black community. Obama rhetoric is, is masterful and really is worth a program in itself, and maybe some linguists uh, should, uh, should study it. Uh, it's, it's classic. Uh, he will write uh, the first paragraph of a speech directed at his base, which of course uh, includes black folks, uh, full of buzzwords that people uh, associate with uh, progressive uh, politics. And the second paragraph directly following that uh, actually negates uh, the first 
first paragraph. That's the uh, real message which is directed uh, at his masters, uh, the people he serves, at Wall Street, assuring them that I don't really mean it. It's, it's really masterful and he uses the same formula all the time. Uh, President Obama came in with a grand uh, plan. Uh, that grand plan included, of course, the grand bargain that he sought to uh, reach with the Republicans uh, for years uh, and uh, only failed in reaching this grand bargain of austerity with the Republicans because of uh, the deep racism in that party and their own uh, institutional imperatives uh, prevented them uh, from agreeing to a grand bargain uh, that was uh, totally in line uh, with with their uh, politics, but he came in. Uh, in fact, uh, two weeks before he uh, uh, took the oath of office, he told uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post's editorial board uh, that entitlements, meaning Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and all of those programs that progressives hold dear, that those programs would be on the chopping block in his administration. So this was his grand plan. Uh, first, to uh, uh, secure uh, the uh, drug uh, industry and, of course, the insurance industry and, and their position in the money stream uh, by uh, passing his Obamacare bill, uh, that is to uh, eliminate the threat of single payer and then move on directly uh, to an austerity uh, domestic uh, uh, policy, uh, while at the same time uh, uh, opening up new fronts uh, in the uh, international imperial war uh, sphere and uh, introducing the Obama doctrine of humanitarian military intervention. So he had a uh, grand scheme partially thwarted by the Republicans uh, themselves uh, due to their racism and their imperative uh, in terms of uh, white supremacy being their organizing principle and how difficult it is even to uh, make peace with a complacent and cooperative black Democrat. Would you grant that having a black family in the White House has positive symbolic value for African Americans? I think it is something that we had to go through in order to remove the illusions of what it means to have uh, a black person uh, at the head of a reigning or ruling national party. Uh, it is a very uh, painful uh, lesson, uh, but one that we had to uh, experience. Uh, you know, uh, there are two currents uh, in black political uh, thought. Uh, and action uh, that have been there uh, ever since there has been a black polity in the United States. One is self-determinationist, uh, you know, a, a politics that is progressive, uh, that seeks to transform uh, the world around us, which uh, inevitably means transforming the world for white folks uh, as well. And, and one that is representationist, that does not seek transformation of society, but only wants uh, to make sure that black people are represented uh, at all levels of the power structure, but is quite comfortable with the power structure. That representationist uh, tendency uh, was fulfilled totally with the election of the first black and, president. And we'll come back to that. When we come back, we'll have more from Glenn Ford, executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. On, 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 on contact. On contact. On contact. With Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges. Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation with Glenn Ford, executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. So you talked about, before the break, Obama as a representation uh, of uh, essentially uh, a figure who gave a black face to American corporate capitalism, American imperialism. During his administration, you saw the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, 3.1 mostly people of color, mostly unarmed, are murdered every day, and of course 25% of the world's prison population. 
Has, has this created a kind of countercurrent? What, what's happening? Well, first of all, I, I think the Black Lives Matter movement uh, was a great surprise. And it was a great surprise uh, to folks on the left. It was a great surprise uh, to those uh, activists still living who'd been involved uh, in the last uh, great uh, mass uh, social movement uh, of, of, of the 60s, that this would arise at this time. Uh, but at least in hindsight, I think we can uh, see uh, the, the logic uh, here uh, that uh, black folks saw after six years of, of a black man in the White House uh, that appeals to power uh, were to no avail in terms of changing the basic power relationships that prevailed on the street, which lead to arbitrary, arbitrary killings of black folks uh, in every city and town in, in the country, uh, and understood uh, that only movement from below uh, stood a chance of, uh, of altering uh, this situation. And so, with Ferguson, uh, we see uh, this, this second coming <laughs> after 40 years of having no mass movement. Uh, and I don't think that that can be separated uh, from the frustration, uh, especially among young people, uh, at the, uh, the, uh, the impotence of the black political structures as they, uh, as they are. Uh, even with uh, a racial ally supposedly in the White House to fundamentally change uh, uh, the black condition. Uh, it, it called forth a, a transformative well, kind also, of movement. Uh, you saw figures like Jesse Jackson go to Ferguson and they were booed. And that was the great first victory uh, of the movement, uh, that it uh, delegitimized uh, these folks who we uh, at Black Agenda Report call the black misleadership class, uh, the class that uh, whose, whose uh, self-imposed mission uh, is to collaborate with the powers that be, uh, a, a game of positioning that they've been playing uh, forever, uh, but that black folks in general uh, never win. How would you assess the eight years? Do you think it's been a negative for black people with Obama in the White House? Uh, how, how would you describe his legacy? Well, I think that it's a positive if we uh, are of the uh, opinion uh, that the black misleadership class must be discredited uh, and that a, a new movement politics uh, must, be, uh, must be encouraged. Uh, so the defeat, the bankruptcy, uh, the clear and public impotence of that class, it, uh, its exposure uh, as being uh, just a, a collaborationist force that is uh, self-serving, uh, that is a, a good thing. It, it, uh, from, from the standpoint of, of, of that class, uh, it's a terrible thing. Uh, but, you know, we, 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 we look at the same phenomenon from different angles. What do you uh, see coming now? Um, we see the rise of the Trump administration. Um, as you yourself acknowledge, much of the opposition to Obama was um, within the Republican Party driven by an irrational uh, racism. Uh, as you yourself pointed out, he was certainly willing to collaborate. Has this kind of white nativist movement, is, is it, could, would you describe it as a backlash against Obama or is it something else? You know, uh, ever since I guess I was 11 or 12 years old, I've been hearing about these backlashes. So it, it, it appears that uh, backlashes are a permanent uh, aspect of the white condition. So uh, I'm not surprised and, and, and I'm not really overly alarmed uh, by the rise uh, of Trump because I don't think it's a, a new phenomenon at all. Uh, I, I think now that people are throwing around this word uh, fascist uh, so promiscuously, uh, maybe folks will uh, start to actually study what uh, fascism means in the United States, where, where I believe we, we have, in fact, uh, experienced uh, fascism. I think that the Jim Crow regimes uh, that uh, held forth in, uh, in, in the south of the United States for several gen generations were classical fascist. Well, you know, Robert Paxton, who wrote Anatomy of Fascism, 
describe the Ku Klux Klan as the most authentically fascist organization in American history? Well, you know, when we talk about fascism and they, they, they talk about classic fascism, because I guess like in music, everything that's European is classic. Uh, but the, the ingredients uh, include uh, the, the threat of mob rule, a one-party state, uh, racism or the hatred of, of others uh, as a, an organizing uh, principle, uh, a regime or a movement uh, that serves the most reactionary uh, elements of the bourgeoisie and a strong uh, element of militarism. All of that was present in spades in Jim Crow uh, America, maybe in a purer form than the so-called classical fascism uh, of Europe. Uh, and of course, none of that uh, went away. Uh, but, but that's not the only kind of fascism, and those of us who try to think dialectically uh, 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 believe that, that, that we should be uh, studying uh, what a Wall Street and Silicon Valley uh, uh, imposed uh, a designed fascism looks like in the country, because that is the much clearer and more present danger. Uh, uh, how does that interact with the old classical <laughs> uh, uh, Southern uh, style of fascism that we uh, inherit? Uh, how do, what kind of compounds, political compounds, does that conjure uh, up? Uh, uh, we don't. We don't. We don't reach any any conclusions or formulate any policies to fight that kind of phenomenon by being hysterical. White supremacy. Protean changes its shape, changes its language, shifts from slavery to convict leasing to segregation to mass incarceration. How did white supremacy fare under? an Obama administration? Well, exceptionalism, American exceptionalism is nothing but manifest destiny, which is rooted in white supremacy. We can have white supremacy uh, with a black uh, face or mascot, uh, as uh, Brother West uh, uses uh, the term. Uh, it, what is fascism uh, in, in the hands uh, or as a, as a as an organizing principle of a superpower, uh, it's quite, it's quite, uh, quite different than than a fascism uh, in Mississippi in 1930. Uh, but it's it's the uh, the danger that we that we live in uh, today. Do you think that's why the Democrats uh, must be examined for their uh, fascism as well as the well understood fascism of Republicans? Well, they took the, the, the Clintons quite consciously took the quote unquote law and order issue, which is the code language for, you know, racist uh, policies and, and, and ran with it. Um, and but, now they've taken McCarthyism and, and run with go. it, dusted right. it off, <laughs> uh, and, and presented it as a shiny new New Year's uh, present. We both got on that list by yes, sir. in the Washington Post. There you go. There's a badge of honor. Do you think that Obama? I mean, he certainly, you know, although you know he is cert he's biracial, but and he didn't he grew up in a white family, and and uh, uh, but certainly wider society considers him black. Do you think that he was able to blunt in any way the white supremacist current, undercurrent within American society? No, I don't think he was able to blunt it. Uh, he succeeded, however, as, uh, in getting more white votes uh, than Kerry, for example. So uh, he was able to move a, a percentage of white folks uh, that uh, even uh, so-called liberal uh, white Democrats uh, were not. That's a small segment of, of the population, uh, which in a winner-take-all kind of uh, po political configuration as we have uh, can can uh, be the difference between victory uh, and and defeat uh, for a candidate or a party. But we should not we should not read those kinds of small incremental uh, differences uh, too large. And just to close, if you could globally comment on how you would define the eight years, how you would define his legacy. 
In terms of foreign policy, uh, he has waged unceasing war against international law and civilization uh, itself. His humanitarian military intervention doctrine, which, which is the Obama doctrine, uh, has thrown international law out the window, uh, done away with uh, national sovereignty as a principle uh, for relations among nations. That is absolutely disastrous, and if we don't fix it, we won't have uh, a world. Uh, domestically, uh, I think uh, in this era, and we're not going to put this on Obama as an individual, uh, we see uh, that capitalism at this stage in its decline can offer nothing, actually is in capable of offering anything to uh, the people. Uh, doesn't even have good tricks up its sleeve. Uh, and that's uh, why it is uh, resorting uh, to uh, internationally uh, its military uh, and domestically its military in the form of the police. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. That was Glenn Ford, executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. Barack Obama and the Democratic Party set the stage for the rise of Donald Trump. They spoke in the traditional feel your pain language of liberalism by assiduously serving corporate interests and imperial power. This hypocrisy and mendacity triggered a revolt, especially by a white underclass that legitimately felt abandoned and betrayed. It left black voters who made little tangible gains under Obama apathetic about Hillary Clinton, who along with her husband, carried out some of the worst assaults against poor people of color. Obama brought with his presence dignity to a despised people, and this may be his most important contribution to African Americans. But he served a system that makes war literally on them. A new radical left, one infused with the wisdom of the black prophetic tradition, will rise to take the place of the corporate mandarins that include Obama and Clinton, or we will see an American fascism. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash on contact. Until next week.